Hi guys, uh, my name is Ashwin. I work as a developer at Hotworks. So I have a little over 12 years of working as a developer in the IT industry. So I started my career working a lot on backend software, Java.net. Uh, over the last few years, uh, I spent some time working on JavaScript, front-end applications, and primarily in uh, large enterprises. Okay. So during my experience here, there are a few lessons I've learned. And uh, I'd like to share some of these with you all. So the intent is to help you all be more productive within an enterprise and also reduce risk for the enterprise, be cost effective, and enjoy the JavaScript and open source experience within an enterprise. Right? So I'm going to be focusing on three things. One is enterprise expectations when it comes to front end software. And Next is how enterprises plan their work and what does it mean when it comes to using JavaScript. And then I'm going to end with enterprise constraints. Okay. So let me start with the, the enterprise expectations. So one of the expectations that many enterprises have uh, is modularization. Uh, it's a very broad term and not very easily defined. And the need for this is because enterprises, they run similar businesses in different parts of the world. And once a solution is done in one part of the world, there is a very high appetite for reuse within the enterprise. But unfortunately, what we've seen is that this kind of reuse is not use case driven. It's often sometimes fictional, sometimes leads to a problem wherein you, know, you might end up incurring very high cost if you don't think about this reuse element and modularization. Or if you overthink it without a use case, you end up over engineering or something. You might end up with something like that. So how do we remediate this when we are in an enterprise? So we try to be prepared for modularization. Right? It doesn't mean you completely ignore the fact. You can do YAGNI, but it's not a very good idea to do all of it in an enterprise. So you need to be prepared. Right? So focus on having loosely coupled code within JavaScript. It's easy to couple things within JavaScript, but you can write loosely coupled code. Favor similar server-side principles such as you know, event-driven communication. So whenever you build modules, see if modules can communicate through events. And something interesting happens, fire an event, that people subscribe to that event and then respond. It becomes easy to change things. One example is, let's say, a login module you have. It can then, once you're successfully logged in, raise an event saying, hey, this user has logged in. People can respond and show various different pages in different applications, right, rather than coupling it to a certain group. So if you have a loosely coupled code, try and share your front-end code as widgets. So more often than ever, we try to build modules that post pages. Rather, build modules that give you configurable widgets, these widgets which can be reskinned, and they are responsive in nature. And most importantly, package your code. Right? Use, a, use a packaging tool such as say Bower or Node. These are standard tools, they follow a standard structure and they're easily shareable. And provision a private module repository within the enterprise. It's very important. So you can you can install something like Artifactory. It has good support for Bower, NPM, and JavaScript modules. So it's good to provision one of these, it makes it much easy to share your modules going forward. And brings a bit of structure to it. So the next expectation I'm going to talk about is non-functional requirements. Large enterprises come with a lot of non-functional <coughs> requirements. Primarily, they prefer custom analytics because there are security concerns on sharing data. So they try to build their own analytic solutions. And these solutions are obviously using proprietary software, and they use different software in different regions in the world. Authentication and authorization is another very big non-functional requirement that's required within enterprise software. And then there is auditing. They want to audit everything. Right? <laughs> so more often than ever, we tend to underestimate the amount of non-functional requirements that are there. Right? And we build it in a way that is not reusable across regions. And the chunk of work increases every time we try to build the same thing in a different region. So how do we remediate something like this? Is 
try and build your non-functional requirements in a non-invasive fashion. Right? Instrument your code with these non-functional requirements. You know, try and favor AOP as a programming paradigm. So I just expand that uh, aspect-oriented programming. Right? So you try and decouple these horizontal concerns. There are frameworks that are available in JavaScript that can help you do this. Frameworks such as Angular AOP, Aspect.js or Mail. Angular AOP supports even promises. So you can actually instrument your code and when promises return, you can actually do things. And obviously unit test these NFRs. They're hard to keep up once they become instrumented. The third one and the boring one uh, is metrics and documentation. So one of the things with enterprises is they do engage a lot of vendors. And there is vendor churn, right? Vendor goes away, vendor comes. And sometimes enterprises want to take on the ownership of the code base that is built by vendors by themselves. And there is a high expectation for documentation and some amount of knowledge transfer that happens in this situation. And whenever you build software, there is a lot of reporting and KPIs related to reports and quality associated with the software that you build. So if you don't plan for this early, it, it will result in ineffective knowledge transfer in the enterprise, resulting in risk to the enterprise, high cost. If you don't put in tools that can help you measure quality, you end up with poor quality software. And there's a pileup of issues towards the end, which are hard, obviously. And then the most boring part, which is a pileup of documentation that hasn't been done, and has to be done once you lose a lot of context. I've been in situations where I've had to work on documentation because it just, it's just part of the definition of done. Right? We are often there to leave it to the end. So choose a JS analysis tool. There are tools which are similar to server-side tools that can generate quality reports. <coughs> Things like code complexity, duplication. They can generate key maps of areas of code that need attention. So there are tools that do that. Sonar, Plexo. Yes, link, the simple one. But put in these tools early as you build your JavaScript front end software. Right? Helps you build much better quality into your code. And I have seen that there's a need for integrating some of the reports that are generated out of these tools with existing back end reporting tools because enterprises prefer having a holistic picture of software. They do not want reports just for a front end and then the back end. Right? So, there is always this desire that comes and then you realize that, okay, how do we do this? So plan for this early, know that this is coming. See what tools are already there, reporting already in the enterprise. See if you can integrate with that, your front-end reporting as well. And use JSTOP for documenting your code. And if possible, try and build live documentation. In my experience, I've worked on tools where I've built live documentation. It changes as the code changes, so you don't have to worry about doing it updating the documentation when you change code. So there are ways to inspect some of the runtime such as Angular and you can actually generate some of this documentation. It's not great, the live tool, but saves a lot of work because it stays up to date with the code. So the next thing I'll focus on is enterprise planning. Enterprises tend to budget year on year and they plan for a year's worth of work. And once this is done, promises are made by the business to their customers. Right? And there's no going back from there. And obviously, everyone knows then functional delivery assumes priority. Yeah. And I heard framework fatigue sometime back. And if you see the JS churn, it could result in frequent rewrites. And this is something that can be very risky for an enterprise and increase tremendous amount of cost. And to avoid some of that, what happens is you end up lagging behind on an upgrade path. And that only delays the whole problem. So this doesn't mean don't do JavaScript. just means that you know, try and be better prepared for this churn. We all know there is churn out there. So prepare for this churn. Protect yourself from churn. And try and create a JavaScript tech product within the enterprise. I'll talk about what this is. So how do I prepare for this journey? 
So all of us are used to writing server-side software where we layer our software and each layer is designated to do something and you, you delegate down, right, rather than coupling with each other. So try and layer your JavaScript code also in a similar way. Our JavaScript application, front-end applications are quite heavy now. There's a lot of logic in there as well. And you can afford to layer it in a way where your top layer, which is your controllers, are tend to be bound to a certain kind of framework, such as say Angular or Ember or React. And then your lower layers, which are your facades that orchestrate talking to services and other things logic, try and keep them playing over JavaScript. Because when you experience churn, then it's only the controller layer that you know, takes the hit. And the rest of it is hopefully easier to change. And favor dependency injection, because this helps you to unit test your code. So you could use something like ECMAScript 6 modules. You could use RequireJS, SystemJS. There are multiple tools out there that help you do dependency injection. It's a good practice. So now that we're prepared, you want to protect yourself from this trend. Okay. So I might be preaching to the choir, but it's important to have very high unit test coverage and very early as well. And of course, try and decouple these unit tests from the framework itself or from the churn. Because if you have to change all your tests, well, you have to change the code, then the whole purpose is defeated. I also recommend having high functional test coverage for front-end applications because they don't make too many assumptions about the underlying tech. And they're kind of isolated from the fact that you choose Angular or you choose Ember or you want to change one from the other. So that is the ultimate safety net that you will have uh, when you're making these kind of changes. And for enterprises, please factor these upgrades into your plan. It's very important. So I spoke about the uh, JS Tech Red Up. So the intent is to bring some form of consistency in this world of churn in JavaScript within an enterprise. So put a core group together that helps determine what JavaScript frameworks that you want to be adopted across the enterprise. These are things that have worked well for the enterprise and you want people to use them more, socialize this. There could be projects that can absorb a bit of risk. So you might want to trial some of the JavaScript frameworks on these projects. There could be some that you're just spiking on and trying to verify does this make sense for the kind of problems that we're trying to solve. And then finally, old is what we recommend not using going forward within the enterprise. So this helps bring consistency in your choice of frameworks. You know, periodically come together to refine this radar. The ThoughtWorks does have a technology radar up there as well, which you can refer to. It's curated at regular intervals. So I'd encourage you to go there and see what the recommendations are. <coughs> so the last bit is uh, enterprise constraints. Right? Some of us have worked in enterprises where there are just too many constraints. So obviously the browser ecosystem, given that we're working on JavaScript. So what I've seen is enterprises like to have their software working on every version of the available browser, right? even the oldest one, IE6, dead now, yes, but when I used to work, they wanted it working on IE6. Uh, <laughs> so most of these browsers that they wanted to work on are not available in the enterprise at all. Right? And it becomes a real problem trying to get these browsers in because then testing takes a long time and you delay is delivery. And some of the JavaScript choices that you make based on this recommended set of browsers might need polyphony, right? which may not perform. So you run the risk of high maintenance based on the browser choices. You also have low performance if you end up polyphony. So how do you remediate this? Drive the browser choices through past analytics, so the analytics that you have from other applications in the enterprises can guide you as to what the browser set your users are currently using. And align your technical choices to the supported set of browsers. Know what browsers are going to be supported and avoid polyfilling wherever possible. And also please set up a process to get these browsers into the enterprise, because these things take time. So the next one is a lockdown environment. Very often you get into an enterprise and you do an NPM install and you find it doesn't work. Right? So you, re you realize that there is limited internet access. They aren't 
used to the fact that you're going to be installing these things from the internet. And everything requires a lengthy software approval process. You go register for an app and it goes to multiple levels of approval and finally it arrives somewhere where you can install it. That doesn't work very well for using something like Node or Bob. So often this becomes a barrier to using open source within an enterprise and could result in tremendous loss of, loss of productivity. So prepare for open source within an enterprise when you're there. Try and provision an internal package repository. This makes them more comfortable given that it is only one repository that accesses the internet. So something like artifactory. So they have more control because it's just one. Request for read-only GitHub access. Because when you say GitHub access, there is fear that you might write something else. So, and software internet access, because the key to being successful with open source is obviously the forum support that you get with it. And if you can't access these forums, it's really hard. The last one I want to talk about was, and the most important one for enterprises, compliance and security. So, with majority of the functionality moving towards the front end and in JavaScript, you find that data gets stored in the browser. It gets stored in caches, it could get stored on the disk. And if we don't realize the vulnerabilities there, it could result in a regulatory violation for an enterprise, which is something which is quite unacceptable. And there is reputational risk, there is financial risk if the data is found to be vulnerable. So there's not much you can do about this, but some things you can is set up a certification and approval process early. Put in a process where you certify whatever data you're going to be storing or sharing in the browser is secure and is compliant with the policies that the enterprise follows. And lastly, we end up minifying our code. Get an approval for licenses and make sure your minification doesn't get rid of the licenses. So maintain the licenses as per what is required in the minification. So these were some of the things that uh, had to learn sometimes the hard way and for a period of time we feel they're doing much better. So just wanted to share with you all. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Could you explain what certification of data is? Can you give an example? So often uh, what happens is one question, for example, is when you store data in the cache or the browser writes data, does it write it in plain text? Is it stored in plain text on the device? And this is something which we don't often pay too much attention to. Right? We store it in the HTTP cache, we assume it's encrypted, it may not be. And what happens if the computer is just left around, if someone gets access to it? So when you sign out of a web application, how often do we delete those caches? Sometimes we just can't because we don't have access to it. So these sort of questions are left unanswered and are discovered rather later. So there are companies that specialize in certifying the fact that your software is doing the thing. And what kind of data is stored in caches and things it inspects. Right? Your application then tells you whether there's a problem. And then based on priority, or you can decide whether it needs to be fixed or not. But there is a risk to an enterprise when it comes to storing data on the client side. Yeah, so I just want to make it clear for myself on your suggestions. So what kind of a JS framework did you use actually? So I have worked with Angular JS. Angular JS yes, for yes. primarily with Angular JS. We've been experimenting a bit with React and Ember, but primarily I've worked in Angular. All this really makes sense, but uh, why do you think how would this fit in a deadline driven development timeline? Exactly, right? So the whole point of this was to share with you all that be aware that you're going to run into all of this. And start by asking these questions up front in your enterprise. There is a planning phase. If you're doing agile, you will be doing an iteration zero. Your iteration zero is where you get most of these questions answered. And if you do and what happens is if you don't have the answers then you can factor it into your velocity, you can do a lot of things. It's better than hitting this wall or multiple walls at periodic intervals wherein it's very hard to react. I go back to the point where those promises are made by the business. And it's very difficult to go back at repeated intervals and saying, hey, by the way, we can't deliver this because I don't have IE6 installed. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a couple of weeks. Right? So, it's just 
just share be aware, plan, run, and advance from this thing. So I just want to uh, ask you, uh, so is there any process to decide what kind of a case framework there's better or from your company? Is there any like a comparison beforehand? You know, like so like in terms of security, in terms of that? In, in my experience, what I've seen is that the kind of problems that enterprises tend to solve, mm -hmm. business problems, common business problems, they are solved well using maybe an Angular or an Ember equity. I find it very hard to decide based on the capabilities of the two frameworks on which one is better. They both rank up the same, for example. But then it, when it comes to things like what experience your current team has, the kind of skill set that you are able to hire, I think those are some of the decisions in an enterprise that make it more prudent to choose one over the other. In terms of capabilities, I have rarely found it easy to say that, okay, we should go with another or we should go with another. So basically, it's, uh, from the majority of the, what the most developers have. Yes, so what I've seen is that once you're ramped up on one of these frameworks, it's hard to change to another one because the value that the other framework brings isn't too much for the kind of problem that we're trying to solve in an enterprise situation. So end up we just take one framework then, I mean, yeah, the, like, you have to stick with that. The decision making to choose the framework is not entirely on the features offered by the framework. There are multiple other things you need to think about. And the skill sets you have, mm -hmm. for example, if there's vendor churn, what are the skill sets within the vendor, multiple things. Learning curve is another example. It's all time we have for questions. Thank you.